Well, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, good evening, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, hopefully, you've had a good and productive week last week. Um, uh, thank you for joining uh, us in this lecture, jointly arranged by the Centre uh, for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and Usul Academy. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Ali Ahmed Shraib. Uh, tonight, we're going to have the seventh and final lecture uh, of the series, Applied Multiplexity, Ibn Khaldun as an example. Uh, the aim of the series is to understand Ibn Khaldun's multiplex approach to social science. And I think I think everybody who's been participating in this whole series would appreciate that the intricacies that has been woven through um, Ibn Khaldun's thinking and how this has been uh, extracted really in the modern context by Professor Shentuk. And I'm hoping tonight uh, the, the finale lecture titled Ibn Khaldun on Good Governance, Circle of Justice will bring all of that into a certain perspective and a good perspective for us. Now, I think our lecturer, uh, I keep saying, doesn't need any introduction, but there may be one or two new people in our in our midst. Uh, so for their sake, I would just like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Rajiv Shentuk, who is our esteemed Dean of the College of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. He was a former founding president of Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. And he holds a PhD from Columbia University's Department of Sociology and specializes in civilizational studies, sociology, and Islamic and modernized Islamic studies with a focus on social networks, human rights, and modernization in the Muslim world. He served as a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and is the founding director of the Alliance of Civilizations Institute. And he is currently uh, the head of the International Ibn Khaldun Society and has a seat on the editorial boards of multiple academic journals. Among his publications, um, which are in various languages, in English, um, there's Narrative of Social Structure, Hadith Transmission Network, 610 to 1505, and in Turkish, Open Civilization Towards a Multi-Civilizational Society and, and World. Ibn Khaldun Contemporary Readings, also Malcolm X, uh, Struggle for Human Rights, and Social Memory, Hadith Transmission Network, as I mentioned earlier on. And Professor's work has been translated into multiple languages, including Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish, uh, which uh, I'm sure would have a very wide reach as well, and rightly so. So that's the short introduction to today's, uh, uh, our lecturer. Um, and uh, just to, as a format again, to remind you, our whole session should be approximately around one and a half hours divided into two 30 to 45 minutes of uh, time for the lecture itself and then another 30 to 45 minutes for comments and question and answers uh, during the uh, first half or during the whole period i'd be grateful if you can keep your microphone and mobile muted until i ask you otherwise uh, we definitely encourage questions and discussions focused on the lecture only but of course one can go off at a tangent a little bit um, depending on how we frame the questions and the comments, but uh, I'll encourage you to keep it to the topic today. Uh, we also encourage you to take some notes, and I'm sure the recordings that we provide on our CAMES web um, uh, sort of WhatsApp group hopefully will be a good uh, aid memoir for further revision notes for later on. So without further ado, I'd be like to ask Professor uh, Shantuk to deliver a lecture, but also to introduce Maybe, and everybody's heard of the Usul Academy, but I'd, I'd like him to introduce the Usul Academy first before he continues with his lecture. So, Professor Shanto, please, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, uh, today, we will be talking about uh, Ibn Khaldun on good governance. Uh, in, with a particular focus on his uh, concept of uh, uh, circle of uh, uh, politics, which is also more commonly known as circle of uh, justice. Uh, uh, but uh, before we begin our uh, talk, I would like to introduce uh, to you uh, Usul Academy. Uh, Usul Academy is an online global virtual uh, college or madrasa uh, offering several programs. Uh, one program is uh, Arabic. Uh, there is an Arabic, academic Arabic program. 
it has different uh, levels and uh, uh, this Arabic program serves two types of students. Uh, one type, students who are only interested in learning Arabic. So anyone who's interested in learning academic Arabic can register to these programs. Uh, it is uh, nine hours per week. And uh, there are several students uh, who just register to learn Arabic and they take uh, nine hours uh, Arabic per week. It meets three times per week because uh, you know, there should be a persistency uh, in uh, studying Arabic so that students can learn about this. Uh, uh, so the Arabic program combines modern methods of teaching Arabic as well as Ottoman uh, methods of teaching uh, Arabic. So it has a very unique method in teaching Arabic and Alhamdulillah, it's very uh, successful. So the other kind of uh, students, uh, uh, they are students of Usul Academy who doesn't have a strong ground in Arabic. So they take one year Arabic as a prep uh, year to prepare themselves uh, to be able to continue studying at Usul Academy. So after one year of study, uh, they reach to very high level of Arabic. Uh, they can follow uh, sheikhs who teach in Arabic. So uh, it's a very strong uh, Arabic uh, program. So this program uh, is conducted in Istanbul over the summer face to face for a brief period. You know, uh, for a month uh, in Istanbul, face to face. This is like the zenith of it. So over the year, they study online. And there is another component at Usul Academy, four years BA program in comparative Islamic studies. Uh, so uh, the, the reason why it's called comparative, because it involves traditional madrasa curriculum, like there's an Izami, uh, or the Ottoman Madrasa uh, curriculum, this traditional Madrasa curriculum, which involves studying uh, Arabic grammar, Islamic disciplines, tafsir, hadith, fiqh, uh, all of them from classical books, not from modern uh, books. Uh, and the reason why classical books are taught because uh, we want our students to familiarize themselves with the classical Arabic so that they can read other classical books without any need for help from uh, others. Uh, so this program, along with the uh, Arabic, Islamic disciplines, also offers comparative social sciences, uh, such as uh, comparative psychology, comparative economy, comparative political thought, ethics, uh, etc. So you see it combines the modern perspectives along with the traditional uh, perspective. Then we have two years MA program in comparative Islamic uh, studies. Uh, we also have one year diploma program in comparative social sciences. This last program, comparative social sciences diploma program, it serves to people who are well grounded in Islamic studies. For instance, Darulim graduates or Madrasa graduates or Bileti Sharia uh, graduates but they need uh, to familiarize themselves with modern knowledge, modern social sciences, modern uh, philosophy. Uh, so it uh, serves uh, to them. So at the moment, like all these programs, academic Arabic program, four years comparative Islamic studies BA program, two years uh, comparative Islamic studies MA program, and one year uh, comparative social sciences uh, diploma program. These are all going on. And there are students from around the world, from uh, Australia to Singapore, Hong Kong, to African countries, European countries, and uh, America. Alhamdulillah, from Pakistan, India, from different parts of the world, uh, there is a very cosmopolitan uh, 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 community of students, and they get to get in. Istanbul for Sohbet program over the uh, summer. And the teaching goes on in Arabic and English. It's bilingual. There are some sheikhs, you know, great scholars 
let's say from Jordan and from other Arab countries, and also academics, you know, from uh, different parts uh, of the world, because it's online, it becomes easy to recruit any uh, prominent teacher and also any good student from different parts uh, of the world. Uh, those who are interested, you know, uh, to uh, study uh, Islam seriously, but cannot travel to a Muslim country, this is an excellent uh, program uh, for them. So you can do it along with your studies in the university or along with your professional work after graduation, you see? So that's why our uh, students, either they are ambitious, successful university students, they register and study at Usul Academy as like a double major. Uh, or professionals who graduated you know, from university, uh, and we, we even have some PhDs, professors you know, from uh, universities uh, who want to add on their education, the Islamic uh, component uh, as well. So we have dentists, the lawyers, you know, uh, you know, people from different uh, professions. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, community. Uh, so these people, you know, they are very established. They have their job, you know, uh, but they want to improve uh, the, themselves in Islamic studies. So it's a serious program. Very serious, very structured, well disciplined, well organized. Uh, for those who are serious, this is an excellent uh, opportunity. So ilim comes to your door, ilim comes to your home. Uh, if you have been longing, you know, to study Islamic uh, knowledge uh, uh, seriously, uh, but you couldn't travel to a Muslim country, this is an excellent uh, opportunity. I think this is enough about uh, Usul Academy. Uh, and Usul Academy is based on the philosophy of rooted revival at Tejdeed al Muassal. Now let's go back to uh, Ibn Khaldun, who was a great scholar, and uh, we chose uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, as an example for applied multiplexity uh, because uh, uh, during my talks about open civilization, like seven series lectures, and then uh, decolonizing social sciences, I talk about multiplexity. Uh, it was about the theory or conceptual aspects of multiplex perspective. So multiplexity is what makes knowledge Islamic. You know, uh, if, the, if there is no multiplexity uh, and the knowledge is based on uh, materialist or idealist reductionism, we cannot call this knowledge Islamic. Uh, Islamic knowledge in general is based on a multiplex uh, worldview. And uh, uh, I was asked like how it is implemented. Uh, and now uh, in this series, I presented Ibn Khaldun as an excellent example of a scholar who applied multiplexity in his works. Uh, this is not unique to Ibn Khaldun. All Muslim scholars, they adopt and implement multiplexity in their thinking and in their work. That's why multiplexity is the key to understand and properly uh, understand uh, Islamic uh, thought. Uh, it's the key to properly understand Muslim uh, scholars uh, and their uh, thinking. Uh, So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ibn Khaldun uh, argues that uh, there are three types of politics in the world. Uh, natural politics, rational politics, and religious politics. Siyasa, uh, or mulk. Al-mulk al-tabi'i, al-mulk al-siyasi, or al-mulk al-akli, or al-khilafa. So three types of political system. Uh, so al-mulk al-tabi'i or natural uh, political system or natural uh, politics, uh, this type of governance is based on force and superiority and subjugation. Uh, 
Uh, in this system, the ruler imposes uh, his or her will on the people uh, through power, subjugation. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, this often leads to deviance from what is just and right, potentially causing turmoil and disobedience among the subjects. It reflects the natural human desire for power and control. So that's al mulk al tabii Then, al mulk al siyasi or al mulk al akli this can be translated as rational politics. So rational politics means causing the masses to act in a particular way. You know, making people, citizens, act in a particular way. But this particular way is required by intellect, by rational insights. Uh, and the goal is uh, developing their worldly interests and avoiding anything that's harmful to them. Uh, so why is not involved? Religion is not involved. It's a rational, good feeling. The goal is not to impose you know, uh, the ruler's will on people. The goal is to uh, 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 serve people, develop, you know, uh, develop uh, their world interest and protect them from anything that's harmful uh, to them. But what's good and bad is decided by reason. That's as siyasa al-aqliya or al-mulk al-aqli. Then al-khilafa, caliphate, and this is religious uh, politics, as siyasa al sharia So the caliphate, al-khilafa, aims to guide the masses, the citizens, the people, based on religious insights into their interest. Because uh, what's, what's the interest of people? How do you know? So as siyasa al aqliya decides based on secular reason without any reference to any sacred book or religion. But siyasa sharia, the religious politics, decides what is good for people, what is bad people, or what's the interest of people with reference to divine revelation, secret, sacred scripture. Uh, so the, those interests, they are not only in this world. Uh, because uh, rational politics or siyasa akliya focuses only on benefits involved in this world. Uh, it's based on al aql al ma'ashi. But uh, siyasa al shariya or al khilafa is based on al aql al ma'adi and it serves people's interest in both worlds, in this life and in the afterlife. So it prepares them to go to paradise. Uh, worldly interests are considered in relation to their impact on the interests of the other world. So they are coupled. Yeah. The mundane, this world interests are coupled with the afterlife interest there. And emphasized by the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, in essence, the Khilafat acts as a substitute for the, the Khalifa, the Khalifa or the uh, Al Khilafa acts as a substitute uh, for uh, the Prophet Muhammad, والسلام, safeguarding the religion and exerting political leadership on a global scale, just like Prophet Muhammad والسلام, did. So he combined religion and uh, politics in his uh, leadership. Uh, so Al Khilafa aims uh, the same thing. So, so today, you know, uh, when you look at the uh, world, what you see is that the uh, it's called uh, the political system is called government, uh, modern government or modern state, and this modern state is run by rational politics, without reference to any divine revelation, any uh, religion. Laws are made by uh, the parliament. So government is the legislative branch. They make the laws. Uh, and, uh, and there is also 
uh, another role for the government is to serve as executive. So legislative and executive powers. Uh, uh, so this leads to absolute political sovereignty. The state sovereign, uh, sovereign will is represented in the law, which governs the society. Then uh, the religious politics in Islamic civilization, as siyas as sharia, so legislation is done by the ulama, because some of the uh, legislation is given by Allah Taala in the Quran and in the Sunnah, so no one can change them. Uh, but some uh, it, there are some new issues. Legislation is needed about them, so ulama makes ijtihad, and that ijtihad. Uh, serves as law, uh, but uh, no parliament. You know, parliament cannot make ishtihad or fatwa. Uh, so, legislative role is has been played in Islamic history by the ulama. But uh, today we have parliaments. There are some Islamic states with the parliaments. Is this possible? Can you make modern uh, secular state system, you know, borrow it from the West and put it in the Islam, Muslim country and make it function according to Islamic rules. Is this possible? So while Allah, while Allah says this is impossible, you cannot convert this modern state model into an Islamic uh, state because the most important thing is the legislation. So uh, in the Islamic uh, system, uh, parliament cannot decide about everything because certain rules are given anyway. And parliament cannot make ishtihad. Ulama must make ishtihad. Of course, you may have some ulama in the parliament and you can ask them to make ishtihad. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, so they can make legislation. Uh, so what's the role of government? It's executing uh, this uh, legislation. Uh, by another branch of the uh, government. Uh, so the Sharia, the moral code embodying God's sovereign will. So sovereignty belongs to Allah Ta'ala in this uh, system. Uh, it takes precedence over any form of worldly political rule, establishing a framework where divine guidance rather than the human guidance governs all aspects uh, of life. Uh, so there are, rule, there are rules, laws that are given by Allah Ta'ala, but not everything is given by Allah Ta'ala in the Quran and Sunnah. Allah Ta'ala left some domain for ishtihad, and also Allah Ta'ala left some domain, mubah, unregulated. So there is a domain directly regulated by Allah Ta'ala. No one can change it. And there's a domain uh, unregulated by Allah Ta'ala openly and directly in the Quran and the Sunnah. It's the domain of ishtihad. It is indirectly uh, legislated you know, through the uh, ulama. And the third domain, unregulated. This is the domain of mubah. So there is the domain of daruriyat. There is domain of ishtihadiyat. And there is domain of mubahat. So mubahat is the domain which is not regulated. Shariatu sakitatun fiha. So Allah Ta'ala intentionally uh, kept silence with regard to those uh, domains. Uh, uh, so the concept of sovereignty is a key concept in modern uh, politics. Who is the sovereign? You know, uh, so uh, uh, human sovereignty became very popular uh, in the modern state. Uh, so human being is sovereign. But uh, this sovereignty of human beings uh, creates a false sense of self-sufficiency. You know, people think, oh, we are sufficient. You know, we have everything. We don't need God's support. 
you know, uh, like that. Uh, but then uh, there are people who argue that uh, human beings cannot be sound. You know, Allah is the sound. And he makes laws and sends those laws through his messengers to uh, people. Okay, so in the uh, human sovereignty model, there is no vertical connection to Allah Ta'ala. It's all horizontal. So this may be called arbitrarist or immanentist morality. But then the uh, in the, the the people who uh, who believe in God, they have a vertical connection, vertical connection. But at the same time, you know, they have horizontal connection with other people, with this world, with nature. So there is horizontal and uh, vertical uh, connection. So trans, uh, there is a transcendental reference. There is a sacred reference in this divine sovereignty model. But in the human sovereignty model, no reference to any divine revelation or uh, scripture. Uh, so uh, the human sovereignty model may be called, from the perspective of Ibn Khaldun, a siyase al aqliya And the divine sovereignty model, which brings together horizontal and the vertical, uh, this may be called as as-siyasa uh, shariya So, uh, if we want to bring in the Ibn Khaldun uh, perspective, you know, we need to bring about a paradigm shift. You know, uh, to khilafet uh, system or divine sovereignty uh, system because this is Ibn Khaldun's uh, view. Uh, however, like uh, uh, in the West, uh, when you study the history of uh, Western political thought and political systems, you see that there are several stages or phases. So there was a time in the West and also in Islam. Uh, God was the only sovereign, and the sacred uh, scripture was the ultimate reference for either the Bible or the Quran. Uh, so uh, during this period, uh, God's authority, uh, uh, irresistible authority, always uh, played a big role. Then, in the age of absolutism, political sovereignty, absolute sovereignty, this replaced divine sovereignty. Uh, so, uh, and this uh, absolutist uh, state system, uh, people like Machiavelli, uh, you know, they used the term uh, sta reason of state. Uh, so, raison d'etat reason of states. So if the interest of states requires, you can do anything you want. And actually, you must do anything uh, you want because it's required by the uh, reason of state. Uh, and then there's absolutism defended by Hobbes. Uh, so this Machiavellian or uh, Hobbesian uh, absolutist uh, perspectives, they are all grounded in uh, the theory of political sovereignty or absolute sovereignty. Then in the economic age, we observe that today, in this postmodern era, the sovereign is not God, the sovereign is not state, the sovereign is the self. So the self decides about what is right, right and wrong, self legislates. So this is uh, the kind of ideology. Uh, so uh, this is the economic uh, age. This may be called as an economic age. So it starts with enlightenment in Europe and goes on. Uh, so self 
as a concept evolves and eventually triumphs, you know, gain a victory over other alternatives. So today, self-interest uh, is at the center uh, of our political and economic uh, thinking. Uh, so Carl Schmitt, you know, describes this very well, uh, how central domains of politics shifted uh, during the uh, recent uh, history. So he wrote that, let's recall the stages in which the European mind has moved over the last four centuries and the various intellectual domains in which it has found the center of its immediate human existence. There are four great, simple, secular stages corresponding to the four centuries and proceeding from the theological to the metaphysical uh, domains. From there to the humanitarian moral uh, stage and then to the economic domain. Uh, so according to Karl Schmitt, you know, from where we got this uh, citation, so he argues there are four stages, phases, in the Western uh, history. Uh, uh, so, uh, so there's a movement away from uh, religion in a constant and continuous way. And so given the overpowering cessation of ever new and surprising inventions and achievements, there arose a religion of technical progress. So this is the religion of modernity technical progress, uh, which promised all other problems would be solved by technological progress. So technology will solve everything. Let's wait until technology progresses. Uh, so uh, uh, the great masses skipped all intermediary stages, typical of the thinking of intellectual vanguards, and turned the belief in miracles and afterlife into a religion of technical miracles, human achievements, and the domination of nature. So these are dogmas of modern politics. Uh, uh, a magical religiosity became an equally magical technicity. This is what uh, Carl Schmitt wrote in his book, The Concept of uh, Politics. Uh, uh, so this transition, you know, uh, from one type of politics to another type, or using the uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, terminology, from siyasa shariya, from al khilafa to siyasa akliya, or siyasa tabiiya, uh, depending on the nature of the regime. So, uh, so there's a big shift in the structure. Uh, so. Uh, in the uh, classical uh, period, moral order was at the top. You know, uh, this is the model of divine sovereignty. Morality, 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 morality is given the top uh, importance. Then political order is subjugated to moral norms. Uh, and economic order is considered the lowest uh, uh, stratum, and uh, everything is regulated by morality, both politics and economy. But we went through a historical transition since the time of enlightenment, modernity. Uh, now, what we have is at the top economic order. And Political order is subjugated to economic order. And the lowest priority is moral order. So this is the value-free politics, value-free economics. Uh, you see there's a structural change you know, from the primacy of morality to the primacy of economics. Uh, and Ibn Khaldun would call this shift from siyasa shari'iyya to siyasa akliya 
or Tabi Aya. So Ibn Khaldun in his Mukaddima drew uh, Da'ira to Siyasa. Uh, but the Ottomans called it uh, Da'ira to Adala. So Ibn Khaldun calls it Da'ira to Siyasa with respect to the procedure uh, or the system. Ottomans called it Da'ira to Adala with respect to the outcome of the uh, system. So Ibn Khaldun wrote that al alam bustan siyajuh al-dawla. Al-dawla to sultan tahya bihi al-sunna. Al-sunna to siyasatun yasusuha al-mulk or al-milk. Al-milk or al-mulk nizamun ya'udduhu al-jund. Al-jund a'wanun yakfuluhum al-mal. المال رزق تجمعه الرعية الرعية عبيد يكنفهم العدل العدل مألوف وبه قوام العالم So uh, in English the world is a garden whose boundaries is the state So what is the state? The state is power Tahya bi sunna the sunna lives with the power of the state. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, statement that the goal of the state is to make the sunna survive. Uh, and the sunna is sharia. Uh, sunna is laws, norms, morality. Uh, so so the, the law is the access of governance managed by the rulers and the rulers ensure order, uh, uh, reinforce the army, the army or, or the rulers are reinforced, protected, supported by the uh, army. The army is government agent, supplied uh, or supplied by money. So supported by economy and economy is sustenance, risk. They are collected by people, and the people are servants protected by justice. Justice is something familiar with which the world survives. The whole world, the whole society, the whole state depends on justice. So you see it's a circular system. What is the symbolism of circle? Why did Ibn Khaldun drew a circle rather than a pyramid. Because usually when people uh, draw a symbolic picture to represent the state, they draw a pyramid. But Ibn Haldun did just opposite, he draw a circle. Why? Because in the pyramid, you have the ruler at the top and in the bottom, you have the people. But in this system, it's not like that. Because circle represents egalitarian system that uh, the sultan, the people, the army, they are all equal. Economy, uh, justice uh, system, these are all uh, equal uh, to each other. You see uh, this egalitarian and inclusive uh, system uh, represented by this a circle of justice or circle of uh, politics. Uh, 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 liberalism tends to see different aspects of society like politics, economy, and religion as distinct spheres which should, should exist independently. So there should, like in America, they, they say there should be a wall separating politics from uh, religion. Uh, so, the, uh, so from this perspective, the public sphere, especially the government, needing to limit its intervention in the private sphere, allowing individuals more freedom in each of these domains. Uh, so you know, religion and uh, government should be separated from each other. Neither state intervenes with religion, 
Norwegian in terms with the uh, state. Uh, so in the political sphere, this separation is often realized as the idea of limited government. Uh, the, this political philosophy tends uh, to favor laissez-faire economic policies, policies which minimize government intervention in the economy. So Emre Khaldun's circle of politics portrays the society as a deeply interconnected system where all spheres influence each other. You have seen this, uh, this circle. It's not separated from each other, rather integrated. But the modern perspective, separating politics, economy, religion from each other. But uh, in the circle, they are all interconnected, you know, as if you know, uh, making up a, a circle. Uh, so, so there's a big difference between circular vision of politics represented by Ibn Khaldun, which is egalitarian, inclusive, and the pyramidic vision represented by Western states uh, or state in other uh, civilizations. Uh, so good governance in this model requires a, a harmonious balance between these spheres, recognizing that actions in one sphere inevitably affect the other. So according to Ibn Khaldun, the ideal state, the ideal state system is here. You see a circular system, uh, all uh, institutions and groups are interconnected with each other. None has primacy. None sits at the center. They're all around the uh, circle. Um, so Isha Berlin long talked about you know, positive liberty and negative uh, uh, li li liberty. Uh, so this is also very much uh, you know, related with Ibn Khaldun's uh, view uh, that there are different types of uh, liberties. Uh, and uh, so uh, 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 liberty from creation derives from dependence on the creator. So this is a you know, philosophical definition of uh, liberty uh, by uh, Skandari. Uh, he who said, the station of servitude is more accomplished than the state of freedom, freedom from Allah, you know, value-free life. So, uh, you know, say, I mean, reaching to a station of being a servant of Allah, this is a great an achievement greater than the achievement of uh, having freedom. Uh, so a good example for uh, positive liberty is the rank of knowledge is the highest rank. You know, a good example, uh, like for negative liberty, uh, for instance, no compulsion in religion. So no intervention to the religious choices of uh, people. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun recognizes uh, these different types of uh, freedom uh, as well. And then the, uh, 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 you know, in Sharia, harm ought to be removed. So this is again a, a negative uh, liberty, an example for le negative liberty. Uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun's uh, vision of liberty and the self and society is that uh, the intellect should be at the top, controlling anger and appetites. Yeah, Akul controlling ghadab and shahwa. So this is for the individual. So individual is like state. And actually controlling the inner world of a human being is called, you know, a siyaset al and then you have the macro system. According to Ibn Khaldun, morality, the Sharia, divine revelation should be at the top, and political order and economic order should be guided by these uh, moral principles. Uh, you see this multiplexity here. 
Uh, so ethical leadership is a must, according to Ibn Khaldun for good governance. So asabiyya leads to political power, according to Ibn Khaldun. In other words, uh, collectivity or collective group spirit. This is what it uh, brings political power and mulk. Uh, so good manners, khilal al-khair, leads to political power. So any group who has khilal al-khair, good manners, eventually they become politically more powerful. Uh, so he who does obtain group feeling, guaranteeing power, and who is known to have good qualities appropriate for the execution of God's laws concerning his creatures, is ready to act as God's vicegerents and, and guarantee among mankind. He has the qualifications for that, the Khilafat. Uh, uh, this prophet is more reliable and solid than the first one who obtained Asabiyya. It has thus become clear that good qualities attest the potential existence of political power in a person who, in addition to his good qualities, possesses group feelings. Uh, this is a citation from, uh, from Mukaddima. So uh, he wrote that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the rulers, uh, they must have good qualities. Uh, if they don't have good qualities, you know, uh, they won't be able to achieve the uh, intended uh, goals and uh, purposes. Uh, uh, so because uh, our time is passing so fast, I won't be able to read this uh, passage from uh, Mukaddima. And uh, uh, so uh, he wrote that أن الدولة العامة الاستيلاء العظيمة الملك أصلها الدين إما من نبوة أو دعوة حق uh, so he wrote that uh, the foundation of great and lasting political powers lies in religion, either through prophethood or through the advocacy of truth. Uh, so all great states have religion as the foundation. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to say that Ibn Khaldun's circle of justice or circle of politics emphasizes the interconnectedness of different spheres of society. This perspective challenges the notion of strict separation between politics, economy, and religion that's often advocated in liberalism. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, good governance requires a harmonious balance between these spheres, uh, re recognizing their mutual influence on one another. Justice, good manners and ethical leadership are the requirement for good uh, governance. Uh, a ruler's possession of group feeling, asabiyya, and moral qualities such as generosity, forgiveness, tolerance, support for the weak, and respect for religious scholars and the religious law contribute to effective governance. Uh, lastly, as we navigate the complexities of contemporary governance, Ibn Khaldun's insights remind us of the need to consider the interplay between politics, economy, ethics, and religion. These needs to be recoupled. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Professor Shantuk. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation there. Uh, I'm sure there has uh, figured out a lot of thoughts and questions. I hope our audience have taken uh, detailed notes on the topic and, uh, and are getting ready for a discussion on this subject. So I'd like to um, basically uh, welcome anybody who wishes to ask a question to Professor or would like to make a comment clarifying what they, their thoughts are on this issue. Um, please do raise your hand um, uh, on on this uh, uh, forum. Uh, I will ask you to unmute yourself and then uh, please uh, ask your question. So um, yeah, so let's uh, lead the way with, uh, and you're also welcome to ask questions in the meeting chat, uh, which we have as well. Welcome to post a, a written question there and I'll endeavor to 
uh, um, sort of uh, read that out uh, to Professor and to, uh, to the group. Um, uh, so you're welcome to do that. So um, yes, the first uh, hand up uh, straight away is Rubaiyat. Rubaiyat, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, please ask your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I hope you're doing well. Um, I, I was, I wanted to seek clarification about uh, this concept. So uh, there's a slide where you're showing the, the vertical and horizontal connection. Uh, and in there, there was a term, self-sufficiency principle. And the term appeared in both the religious, you know, divine law and human law. Would you please uh, explain what is the self-sufficiency mm -hmm. principle as it relates to both divine law and? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, this is very important. Uh, uh, I could not go into detail uh, too much. Uh, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, demonstrate that uh, the secular uh, uh, political political thought and system doesn't make any reference to sacred to metaphysics to transcendent uh, the transcendental world uh, so there is no vertical dimension so they think we are self-sufficient we don't need god you know we can take care of ourselves so no need for vertical connection with god okay <laughs> you know uh, but on the other hand uh, people who accept God, who accept uh, transcendence, who accept the uh, metaphysical world and the divine world. So they have a vertical connection. And the kind of politics they do is a siyasa a shari'a, religious politics, because there is reference to God. And politics has a vertical dimension. And in that case, those people think we are not self-sufficient. We need God. You know, but God makes them self-sufficient. Uh, so faith in God makes you more self-sufficient than denial of God and pretending as if you are self-sufficient. So, so to, these, uh, these two approaches uh, bring about different political thoughts and different political systems. Right. So the self-sufficiency in divine rule is derived from uh, a connection with the with, with God yes. and, and, and yes. an observance of the. Yes. The so I mean, uh, like your connection to God makes you more self-sufficient. Uh, but uh, those atheists and seculars, uh, they say if you are self-sufficient, you don't need God. Right. Hmm. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you put your hand down, Rubai, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if uh, I th Yes, I have another hand up here. Uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Mohammed Kalam, Ka Mohammed Kalam, please lower your hand on mute yourself and please feel free to ask your question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I hope you well. Thank you very much for your beautiful presentation regarding this uh, really, really interesting and relevant topic. First, uh, first uh, uh, point I'd like, I just want to ask a question, uh, what's called, about the Usul Academy. Is there, like, the, what sort of charges are there? It is going to be found on the, on the course when we Google it, or is it, what sort of, do you, how we can find this? Yeah, it's uh, it's in the web page. It's in the yeah. web page. You know, uh, ah, okay. Yeah. All right. But, we'll, be uh, we'll be able yeah, to yeah. find but out. But those okay. who, you know, uh, who are really good students, you yeah. know, uh, there is uh, the uh, scholarship based on need and merit. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Need and merit uh, scholarship. Uh, uh, regarding, uh, thank you very much. Regarding the topic, um, you know. Uh, you talk about three sort of politics. The last one, it's, it's obviously the last one is, uh, is infinitely rewarding. It does reward us here and of course hereafter. 
So my question, even though it is infinitely rewarding, the politics with uh, religion, why it seems like it is less popular to the people? What, why people are not attracted to this uh, politics? What could be the reason? Oh, uh, 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 I don't think uh, people are less attracted to religious politics because, uh, you know, like uh, sociology shows that religion is very important in uh, politics. Uh, uh, I can give you many examples, but I don't want to get into like daily politics. <laughs> at the moment. However, but, however, but we, we, can see... look, we can look at like recent elections, like, uh, you know, uh, look at the candidates. You know the, whether the more religious ones or uh, less religious ones. You know. You oh, know, I'm uh, not talking about in terms of Turkey. I'm talking about, let's say, in general, uh, all over the world. Let's say. Yeah, like look, in, look at in, India. In, in, if you look at in, India, the guy is religious. Um, okay, India could be in Europe. Um, it's not. It seems like I don't have yeah. data. So you know, uh, better better not to make any generalization. You know, yeah. uh, so you know, uh, sometimes like people are attracted to uh, religious uh, politics, sometimes less religious uh, politics. You know, uh, and the competition is still uh, going on in the world. Uh, 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 but uh, in reality, what they are doing the same. You know, it is uh, what Ibn Khaldun called either like a natural uh, politics based on uh, you know. Uh, imposing your power on other people and make them act in a particular way or siyasi akliye you know uh, which is focused only on the uh, happiness of people in this world regardless of the hereafter okay yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so that could be uh, because uh, in public sphere even if you are religious let's say in the western world you are not supposed to bring religion in as I have mentioned, like there is a wall in America between religion and politics. Uh, so even if you are religious and you gain the election uh, by the support of religious people, you are not supposed to bring in religion in uh, politics. So government and religion are separated from uh, each other. Uh, so the true religious politics is what Ibn Haldun calls as siyas as sharia you know, it's based on the Khilafat. So the, every human being is a Khalifa of Allah on earth. You know, uh, and, uh, and this kind of politics aims happiness of its citizens both in this world and in the hereafter. You know, and that's okay. why anything sinful, anything against the will of God, anything uh, which will cause people to go to hellfire in the hereafter, that type of government tries to protect its citizens from this. So it still serves the interest of its citizens, but from a multiplex perspective, including this world and the hereafter. You know, on the uh, one hand, they say, you know, they are offering them like nice roads, you know, good uh, economic uh, prosperity, etc. But at the same time, thinking about the uh, well-being of the citizens in the hereafter. That's what Ibn Khaldun calls uh, religious uh, politics. And uh, today, of course, uh, this type of politics is very rare. And I agree uh, with you. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but uh, this is sociological classification by Ibn Khaldun. You know, this is what exists uh, in the world. So you see that it exists even today. Uh, still goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just uh, another another point. Uh, yes. In terms of you know the previous question, you said uh, the politician who are uh, doing politics based on um, ethics. The second one, they are they feel like they are self sufficient. They do not require any sort of um, assistance from God or Allah, uh, so they, they feel like they are sufficient enough. Um, I do have a different point on this, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, point that 
my understanding, even the people who the, who do politics based on their faith, they feel far more sufficient because they themselves believe uh, their creator is sufficient and therefore they are way more sufficient than any other person or any other politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank so you there very are two much. types of uh, feeling self-sufficient. You know, one, you know, by denying God and declaring, you know, we are self-sufficient self -sufficient by ourselves, you know, and focusing on this mundane happiness yep. in this world. So this is one kind of self-sufficiency. And the other one, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, self-sufficiency derived from faith in God. Uh, but also there's another aspect of this. Uh, so those people who think, I don't need God, I'm self-sufficient, then they need a lot of support from other people. You know, they think they need all these material, uh, you know, instruments. Uh, so, but then the person who, uh, you know, relies on God, believes in God, uh, you know, he thinks I am not dependent on all these instruments around me. I am dependent only on Allah's support. Uh, so you see uh, how faith in God liberates, you know, uh, people from feeling dependent or needy uh, to all these uh, like modern uh, instruments uh, 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 around himself or uh, herself. Uh, so he says, uh, and he makes tawakkul, for instance, like relying on God. You know, hasbun Allah. Allah is sufficient for us. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. You know, power can come only from God. You know, all these things makes you uh, liberated and freed from other people and from other things in uh, the world. Uh, uh, because you relativize them, you put them in a broad perspective. This aql ma'adi, you know, the kind of thinking that brings together this world needs and other world needs. At dunya wal akhira. You see, Mahavardi wrote this book, Adab dunya wa din. So he brought din and dunya together. You know, uh, so uh, those who think horizontally, you know, no din, no akhira, no God. But then, because they are materialists, they think they need material uh, world. But then those who believe in God with this vertical point, uh, you know, uh, they less rely on the material world, they rely on uh, God's uh, support. Uh, so this uh, horizontal and vertical must be together. Dunya wa akhira must be uh, together. So thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, I think there is a, a question from an invisible hand of uh, Naim, uh, who is uh, uh, he has requested that he had a question. We can't raise his hand, so I'm going to uh, ask him to ask his question very shortly. Just to remind everybody that we uh, we put a link up for our WhatsApp uh, chat group uh, for Kames. Uh, please do join it. You'll be uh, updated with uh, a recording of this lecture and other future events. So I strongly encourage you to join the Kames very strong um, a group of, um, uh, you know, uh, your fellow uh, sort of thinkers um, in that group. So the link is actually in the chat and we'll put it again for later on. So Naeem, um, uh, if you'd be kind enough to unmute yourself and ask the question, yeah? Thank you. And I'll, I'll read some from the chat group later on as well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the um, excellent lecture as usual. Um, you see, the whole discourse, if I could understand it properly, of Ibn Khaldun is based on God, because he was living in an Islamic society in, uh, in the 14th century. Uh, but now we are living in a world, modern world or postmodern world, whatever way uh, you'd like to uh, say it, and where, uh, as Nietzsche says, God is dead. So no ethics, no morality no God. So in this world, how do you see the Ibn Khaldun's um, theory and um, methodology is applicable? Doesn't it require in a, a society um, similar to the Islamic civilization or Islamic society? 
Yes, uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, you know, I am founder of Ibn Khaldun's International Khaldun Society. You know, we organize every two, three years International Ibn Khaldun. And uh, the people who come and present papers, they are asked to do applied Khaldunism. Applied Khaldunism. By this, we mean get a theory or concept or method from Ibn Khaldun and apply it to a contemporary problem you know, and demonstrate that his ideas are still relevant and applicable and they serve uh, in the explanation and solving the problem better than the existing alternatives. Uh, you see, uh, uh, and uh, you know, there are like uh, hundreds of papers have been presented in these uh, conferences to demonstrate like how uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, can be practiced today. You know, his ideas, how can they be practiced today in many fields, in psychology, in sociology, in economics, in politics, in social health, you know, in education, in many areas. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 so in particular, like in tax collection, Ibn Haldun has a very particular theory. You know, uh, it's very uh, famous. And also, like, do you need big government or small government? So he says the state should not involve in commerce and business. It's like all these ideas are currently discussed, you know, among many uh, circles, uh, even by uh, non-Muslims. Uh. So another just uh, a complimentary question with regard to um, what you mentioned about the research papers and the um, uh, the conferences that you make. It, are those papers publicly ac accessible? Do we have the, um, can we, uh, you know, get a ha hand on them? to do our own research on understanding and on reading? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the first uh, symposium uh, was published uh, in the uh, Asian Journal of Sociology. You know, it's printed by Brill as a, as a special issue. And it's also printed in Turkish as a separate book. Mm. You know, uh, but the, the others, you know, uh, unfortunately, they have not been published, but uh, the talks, they were uh, on a web page uh, as a video, but the web page collapsed. <laughs> this was a problem and we lost all the records uh, of the talks, uh, unfortunately. So like great scholars came and presented, but uh, you know, the papers have been lost. Uh, very unfortunate, but we are looking forward to have um, uh, whatever existing exists there. If you could kindly ask you, Tim, to um, put them to online so that public can access them and get to know more about that. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Great. Inshallah. Thank you, Naeem. Um, so just a couple of uh, comments and question, actually. Two questions from the uh, Usama Wakil has asked, if everyone is the servant of state, uh, then there, is there room for entrepreneurial activity? then how we value intellectual property rights in an era of technological developments, how we promote research and development in society. I think he's um, sort of probably picking up on a point. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very good, uh, very good uh, question. Uh, this is because of the English translation, you know, uh, like this concept of ra'iya and ra'i is not easy to translate to, uh, to, uh, to English. So I usually translate as citizens, mm. although uh, the meaning is very different than uh, the citizens or, uh, or subjects. Uh, so ra'iyya means, you know, people who are served, taken care of, and protected by the state. Mm. But uh, the English translation, like, you know, it says servants. Uh, you know, uh, so it's not like exact uh, translation that gives wrong uh, meaning. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, serving, uh, being a servant of the state uh, does not mean like uh, 
you know, dedicating all your life to the state. Now we are all servants of the states where we live. Hmm. You are paying taxes. You know, uh, you are contributing in many ways. You know, uh, to the state uh, under which you live. You know, uh, so in many many ways, uh, knowingly or uh, uh, unknowingly, uh, so you somehow contribute. <laughs> You know, to the existing system, like one way is, you know, like paying taxes. The other way, uh, like uh, you know, the, let's say you, you are doing something for other citizens. That's also you know help that, that helps to stay. Let's say you are a doctor, you know, you are uh, you know serving the other citizens. So this also helps the state legitimacy, because uh, people think you know our state. You know, is providing us health, good health care. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if there is no health care, if there is no doctor, they may rebel against the state or just leave uh, the state uh, because there is no good health care. Uh, so, basically, by serving as a professional in your own profession, you are serving the state. Uh, so, sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's uh, uh, indirect. Uh, but the word, you know, servant is not a good translation. You know, uh, inshallah, you translate in a better way. Thank you. Um, second question comes from Muhammad Hadi. Uh, he sort of picks on your point about the, um, the, the basically the religious governance of Al Khilafa, having seen Khilafa as one type of governance in work of Ibn Khaldun too. Considering the fundamentalist reading of it among many insurgent groups, I would like to know how much you see Khilafat system of governance in modern world applicable. Yes. Uh, so what does uh, Ibn Khaldun means by the Khilafat system is a system that that's concerned with the well-being of citizens in this world and in the hereafter. You know, uh, and it's connected to divine you know, uh, and uh, so we are all Khalifa of Allah, you know, because we are human beings. Every human being is a Khalifa of Allah. Yeah. But head of the state is Khalifa of Rasulullah. You know, Khalifa of Rasulullah, wassalam, in his political role, not in everything. Yeah. You know, only in the political role. Uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, the Khalifa state, uh, Ibn Khaldun doesn't mean what we mean today. You know, uh, for him, like uh, people who are connected to Allah Taala, to transcendent. You know, uh, so first they use divine revelation to decide what is right and wrong, what is good or bad. Second, they have some revealed revelations given to them by manuscripts. I mean, uh, by scripts, you know, sacred books uh, of Allah Taala, like Quran, Injil, Bible, and then other uh, others. Uh, uh, and the third, this kind of politics is concerned with the well-being of the citizens, both in this world and in the hereafter. So these are the major uh, distinctive qualities of the Khilafah politics uh, Ibrahim Khaldun mentions. Uh, so I think, uh, Professor Rajib, uh, the uh, it's a very good, I thought that was a good question. And my sort of question uh, to you, I'm going to take my my chair's privilege and ask my question because I think it fits this issue. I, I was reading a book um, by Professor Khalid Abu El Fadl uh, from uh, the US on speaking in God's name. Um, he's written a book quite a few years back when I was doing my uh, master's um, and uh, writing about how the 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 religious text is ultimately interpreted so when when in the authority we talked about sovereignty we talked about authority uh, and in this case islamic authority um, or sovereignty belongs to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but ultimately the ummah has the authority and the khalifa is given the authority on behalf of the ummah but when it comes to speaking in in god's name as he calls it in in his book uh, the interpretation of the text, the, the 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 sort of revealed text, is where the contention lies. And I think Muhammad Hadi's question is where, as we know these days, many groups that have come historically 
in the modern recent modern era claiming to be speaking in god's name on this planet in trying to bring connect the temporal with the spiritual world uh i.e this relationship of khilafa between uh you know uh hasana dunya and hasana fil uh, is is what they intend so how does one uh, really sort of uh, navigate this territory where uh, you i know you mentioned about ijtihad you talked about the ulama uh, mm -hmm. having, having a role in uh, creating the uh, the, the legislation or each they had doing the each they had mm -hmm. in your one of your slide you had the the government itself being the executive of the of the the sort of uh, thing uh, the laws that ultimately are uh, derived from uh, the books so this is an area where I think is a big yes, contention yes. in the Muslim world yeah what are your thoughts yeah, first on of all uh, the title of the book is wrong you know uh, I mean Islamically no one yeah. can speak you know, uh, with the voice of God, only Pope and the Imam in Shia yeah. you know, uh, speak with the voice of God. Yeah. You know, in Ahl Sunnah, no one you know can speak with the voice of God. Yeah. You know, uh, so even those who make ishtihad, you know, like ishtihad means I did my best. You know, uh, ishtihad does not mean like automatic law. If Ishtihad was like speaking with the voice of God, then we would have only one Ishtihad. Yeah. So, because we have on single issue, like many Ishtihad, so can you say there are many voices of God speaking in ikhtilaf, you know, in uh, like a, in a divergent way with each other? <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Uh, and uh, uh, like our ulama, you know, uh, uh, they make uh, Ishtihad. But they say Allah Alam. You know, Allah knows best. Uh, so this is what uh, I did. Uh, that's why there is diversity, you know, uh, of uh, ishtihad. There is diversity of uh, fiqh masjid. If we had like ulama speaking uh, with the voice of God, we wouldn't have mezahi. Hmm. We would have just single way of acting. <laughs> uh, so uh, our ulama does not uh, say this. Uh, uh, so no one speaks with the voice of God in Islamic uh, civilization, mm -hmm. and such a claim would be not only pretentious, but also haram. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot say my ishtihad is like the I only mean, yeah. correct thing, and it's God's will. Who who are you to tell like uh, God's will? <laughs> See what I mean? You just, you know, present. No, that's your... a very valuable point you make. Yes, I think yeah. that would be a good criteria by judging somebody who actually understands the context of which yeah. they had and, and its relevance to it. And yeah, anybody yeah, yeah. who de demands authoritative following or uh, mm -hmm. and says, I am the authority, then mm -hmm. I think we look elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, then there's some uh, ignorant people or charlatans who pretend as if they are speaking with the voice of God. <laughs> You know, I mean, but real scholars never do this uh, sure. because uh, freedom of expression is protected by our fiqh, yeah. our sharia, in particular, this ishtihad theory and also the zaniyat uh, theory. So these two uh, perspectives guarantee uh, freedom of expression in the Muslim world. Uh, Sure. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll have a. Uh, I will go to the next hand raised uh, by Said Haider. If I could ask you to lower your hand, unmute yourself, and <coughs> free to ask your question, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, my uh, whether it's a question or you can elaborate it too. That my observation is in, in Turkey. Uh, that uh, the reformational and islahi uh, movement or tahrik uh, went on for many decades and resulted in uh, bringing almost more than half of the population towards voting for uh, the political parties that stood for uh, religious ideals. Uh, is there not a lacking of this kind of all-inclusive uh, Islahi or reformational effort in uh, Indian subcontinent, where the political parties 
that stood in the name of religion became controversial uh, by not dissociating them from the political effort. And, uh, you know, this led to just having 10% of the uh, casted vote going for the religious parties, for example, in Pakistan. So is that not a model that other uh, Islamic countries uh, should consider that focus on the reformational and an Islahi movement that totally dissociates from polit politics? And they have a, a facade of a, a, a political movement that then uh, can be elected once a majority has been uh, convinced that uh, religion uh, has a place. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, uh, actually, it's not easy to decide like who is religious, who is not religious. You know, in the Muslim world, uh, so like you have some people who are like associated with completely secularist or leftist parties, but they are very good religious people, and then you have uh, people who are associated with uh, like let's say you know, right-wing religious parties, and they're not really good people. <laughs> See what I mean? So uh, it's a complicated issue to uh, to decide. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So we have a, a time is uh, drawing close very shortly. So I'm going to just ask one quick question from Shagufta on uh, the comment section. Does Ibn Khaldun have any principles of economics laid out within the framework of morality? Has he covered the issues of principle mm -hmm. of economics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but it requires like a separate lecture about his, you know, uh, economic uh, views, uh, like uh, how you can, you know, uh, revive uh, economic life. Uh, but uh, most, you know, like there are several important issues first, he argues state should not intervene in uh, in economics because it disrupts competition. Uh, so he you know, defends small governments. Uh, this is uh, one thing. Second, he argues that taxes should be less. And he uh, paradoxically argues that less taxes bring more revenue to the state. And the more taxes bring less revenue to the state. And he says, in the beginning of the state, you know, uh, they charge less uh, taxes, but towards the collapse of the state, they charge more uh, taxes. <laughs> you know, but more importantly, he sees that there is a, a tension between morality and prosperity, economic prosperity and wealth, you know? So what's the, what's the impact of wealth on people's morality, religious life? And how does it affect society in general? Mm. Uh, so he argues this is a very sensitive issue. You know, if it's not well taken care of, then wealth may undermine morality. And once morality is undermined, the society is on a slope. You know, it will uh, be doomed <laughs> at the end uh, because without uh, morality, a society cannot function and survive. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I would ask Omar, who's raised his hands um, to unmute himself and ask a question. I think we're coming maybe to the last one or two questions of this session. So, Omar, if you'd be kind enough to ask your question, please. Are you yeah, still thank there? Thank you very much for giving me this ask. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa um, I'm very pleased to participate in uh, this wonderful session. And the professor has mentioned that uh, nowadays, uh, there are parliamentary system, but in Sharia system, ulama will make the laws. But in this uh, in this time, as we see that uh, many countries are following parliamentary system. So, what will be the Sharia system nowadays? If there is no parliament, then um, 
how we select or elect the rulers or how the people will select the ulama? Yes, uh, the way we have been doing it for 14 centuries. You know, because this is not a new question. <laughs> you know, we have been doing this for 14 centuries. So there are set traditions, you know, like what's the role of the you know, ulama re regarding legislation and the state, uh, uh, etc. So basically, like, uh, you know, uh, ulama makes ishtihad, you know, they make ishtihad, and this, if the state wants, they can, you know, adopt those ishtihadats and turn it into a law. They can codify and turn it into a, a law. So it's a big debate whether parliament can be a legislator. You know, <laughs> so uh, some people, they say no, it cannot. Some say yes. So there's a big debate uh, going on uh, about this, uh, you know, uh, whether modern nation state can be Islamized. Yeah. People like Ibn Khattab, like Wail Halak, argue that no, it's impossible. You cannot Islamize nation state. You know, it has defects <laughs> Islamically, which cannot be fixed. Uh, but then some people argue the opposite. They say, no, 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 we can Islamize the modern state structure, you know, uh, uh, make it Islamic. Uh, so there is an argument going on uh, around this issue. So, and there's no conclusive uh, answer yet. Uh, okay. One uh, second question from Usama Wakil. Um, uh, slightly, probably a bit more sort of very specific niche question. Um, his question is that the money the, is generated to support government or army in a society or nation. Um, how is money generated is to support government in uh, or army in a society or nation which lack natural resources? And where we start the cycle of economy? I'm not sure if it's a topic that really, I mean, requires a separate discussion altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Qatar is an ocean. Yeah, it know, is. Hundreds and thousands of people, you know, study like all these issues, yeah. you know, and there are hundreds and thousands of uh, a thesis, MA, PhD, yeah. you know, uh, written on Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. Uh, so those who are interested, you know, they can refer uh, to those uh, books uh, yeah. because we cannot exhaust everything. So yeah. our topic in this uh, last yeah. presentation was on his uh, idea of a political system as a circle, yeah. as opposed to a pyramid. Pyramid system. Because, yeah. uh, like a state is depicted as a pyramid mm. in other uh, like prominent yeah. uh, ideas. But yeah. he presents state system as a circle. Mm. So it is something really uh, unique uh, uh, to think about it. Uh, so this was major point, you know, uh, in this talk. Uh, other issues, you know, I mean, uh, you have to uh, read it uh, uh, more carefully. And I suggest everyone gets a uh, muqaddimah and read it. Uh, yeah. There are two types of muqaddimah. One is uh, printed by uh, Princeton University Press, three volumes. And uh, I think at the moment, this is not uh, available. Uh, but then there's an abridged copy by uh, Bruce Lawrence, uh, uh, printed by Princeton University Press. I believe this is available. So better, you know, one uh, needs uh, by himself. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just again, I'm again conscious of time. I'll allow four or five minutes maximum now, and then we'll uh, bring this session to a close. Uh, Danielle, uh, you've got your hand up, please. If you lower your hand and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Santo. How are you? Uh, Alhamdulillah. How about you? Alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you for this insightful session. I really learn a lot from it. I hope this is not the last session I have. We have more of these, more of these sessions you now. So uh, I just want to, you know, put a thought in front of you. I'm struggling with it nowadays for in my own research. Uh, you know, it's a general question uh, related to political order. Uh, and to some extent, Ibn Khaldun has helped me understand that as well. 
when we talk about political order or politics in general then you know there is also this thing that there should be a possibility for a political order which means that society should have a ontological structure if society does not have that reality or ontological structure then political order will not be possible so i mean based on my research uh, what i have seen is this that allah subhanahu wa taala has created people uh, or society into levels for example somebody is intellectually very superior somebody is intellectually not that superior that is the what you call reality which enables political order so i just want your comment on that that political order is only possible because you know like we have masses we call these you know these are the masses so masses only think in in terms of closed loop if they can you know come out of the closed loop then they'll not be masses then they'll be intellectual elites so uh, i think i just want your confirmation and commentary on that that you know this is how the society is structured this is how allah subhanahu wa taala structured the society it is only because of this ontological structure that political order is possible and i think ibn khaldun also talks about group solidarity and he says that generally people think within the you know confines of a group is mm-hmm. this how the society is structured i just need your comment on confirmation on that Thank yes you. yes yes uh, yeah this is a very important question you know uh, societies are characterized by diversity and inequality so you cannot eliminate inequality in society you cannot eliminate diversity uh, but uh, you know uh, there are two issues uh, uh, regarding uh, this fact in ibn khaldun's thought first justice you know he always emphasizes justice even the system like you know he uh, drew uh, this circle is circle of justice uh, so justice is very important when you have justice these inequalities and diversity is managed very well okay there is no harm you know uh, but if this inequality and diversity are not managed fairly with justice then it's a big uh, source of uh, problem yeah uh, so this is something Uh, very important to uh, keep uh, uh, in mind. Uh, 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 so diversity uh, and inequality cannot be completely eliminated, you know. Uh, but how are we how are we going to handle it? So the answer is al adale, justice, you know, fairness uh, with all diverse people, with those like. people who are you know characterized by uh, inequality thank you uh thank you for that actually i uh, i think we will bring the session uh, i think we're running out of time i just want to before i conclude i just want to leave a a, a, a pondering uh, thought to our esteemed group here uh, professor you mentioned about sovereignty and shifting paradigms um and you mentioned for where how people have moved on to the reign of humans now um and maybe today is a very uh, interesting day where the media is full of discussion about the maybe the reign of artificial intelligence so we are actually coming to the era where is <laughs> we're handing the baton of of sovereignty of from the humans to ai and this is a discussion point that's taking place where in the past people took it the sovereignty from the hands of the almighty and took it onto themselves and it looks like they can no longer handle it and we want to pass it on to something yeah. called the ai and maybe we'll have to face the consequences of that and i don't not sure where it fits into the circle of justice yeah. of it. how good <laughs> yes, yes, yes yes a very good question very good question so but i thank you uh thank you everyone actually for joining today's uh, session uh, that's all we have time for and this was the last lecture of our series um we're working on our next series uh, so please uh, keep your eye on the on the group um and more details will be shared on the whatsapp group if you haven't joined the link is in our in our uh, chat group please do join uh, i'd like to uh, finally thank professor dr rajiv santhup for preparing the slides and delivering this lecture uh, this has taken i can see there's an immense love and 
passion behind this work and we thank him and we we really appreciate the effort and in his own time that he's taken to address us and and uh, join us uh, week after week uh, in this quite a monumental series that we've had and increase our understanding uh, of Ibn Khaldun's thinking and how multiplexity really applies to society today. And I really like your the phrase, multiplexity is what makes knowledge Islamic. I think that's a very lovely phrase to actually ponder upon. Um, uh, the We hope to work together in the future, Professor Shentul, and I'm looking forward to a future uh, sort of series and 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 um, on basically uh, unraveling the the sort of the vast areas of knowledge that you have acquired over the years and as well as hopefully pass on to the general public like us uh, in in this field and uh, and I'm hoping for the contribution of the public as well in this. This is really the forum and this is the way we want to deliver uh, this knowledge to the mass masses as well. And I'm hoping Kames can have uh, some contribution in delivering this uh, type of knowledge uh, to the wider audience. Uh, so um, um, I, with this in mind, I'd like, uh, Professor, I'd be grateful if you could just hang on for a couple of minutes afterwards uh, before, uh, after the end of this session, but I'd like you to take leave from everybody else and thank you again for joining and uh, watch out for the recordings available of the, these uh, seven lectures and hopefully you can uh, go through them in your own time and we'll post it in our, our link. And thank you and good evening to all. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.